So it was really great to watch the panels this morning and the talks this morning. And so many of those talks and panels focus on our strengths, on the training, on the things that are going well. And I think inevitably it's important also to focus on our challenges. And you can make an argument that perhaps it's even more important to focus on our challenges. So um, a lot of what this panel is going to talk about today are the things that lie in front of us that we really need to be watching that are related to sort of the health and finances and strength of our community to be able to produce and maintain a workforce. I want to just start with one thing Steve Knob mentioned. We know what the workforce looks like in the next 18 years. We do know what the look workforce looks like in the next 18 years, and we know that this region is going to feel strained, not by the quality of the workforce, but by the quantity of the workforce. And right now in the region, the older half of our workforce outnumbers the younger half by almost exactly 100,000 people. That means for every person we have retiring out of the workforce, we only have a fraction of a person entering it. Just since 2010, our region is down 38,000 kids compared to 2010. Um, and so we know that when it comes to the quantity of people that we can train, that we can employ, that we can get uh, into our employment centers to allow economic development to continue, that this is a regional challenge we need to keep our eyes on. One of the biggest factors related to that challenge is not only the availability, but the affordability of housing. Okay. Um, the saying goes, residential leads commercial. In order for us to have economic development, in order for us to have companies who want to come and produce goods and services that we need and want, we need a place for their employees to be able to live. Um, right now in Ulster County, the, the family making typical wages in Orange County can qualify for a mortgage, a maximum mortgage with a perfect credit rating of $225,000. To buy the typically priced home in Orange County, you would need to qualify for a mortgage of $380,000. So that's a $170,000 gap. Uh, just in the past three years, we've seen rent go up 25, 27% while wages went up 5%. So there's a lot of housing stress that affects our desires and our goals for continued economic development in the community. And that's why I want to start with John first. John, let's talk about what community leaders in this room can do to allow and encourage more housing for people across the entire spectrum of incomes so that we can maintain a workforce and support a workforce uh, to, to, um, to support all these wonderful projects and initiatives that we talked about today. Great, uh, thank you everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I know I could see all your eyes when you were reading my bio, but to say, that guy never ran a marathon. But <laughs> it, was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a while ago and maybe someday again. Um, but when it comes to housing, if there's, one thing I need to impart, it's we want to provide housing. We need to have the community will it and support it. And that's the biggest problem. And as I see in my travels, you know, on all ends of the spectrum, there's two fallacies that I think we need to address. The first fallacy is that housing doesn't pay for itself. I hear that time and time again, and it's not just from what we would call NIMBYs. It's also from commercial developer clients who I represent, who when they're having a problem with the planning board, tell me, just go tell them we'll put uh, 100 housing units there. Then they'll change their mind. And I say, that's exactly what this community probably needs is 100 housing units. Um, but they say it anyway, and the communities usually listen because the focus is on rateables and people don't understand that in order to have rateables, you need housing. Jobs need a place to go sleep at night, and that's what houses are. Um, now, if you, and also, we want the jobs we create to sleep in Orange County. That's very important because it's not only that the commercial facility will be pay a rateable, when that middle level manager at Legoland moves to the area and looks and says, well, within a 40-minute commute, I could live in several different counties in the area, or I could actually live in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. If that person chooses to live in Orange County, when that person takes their family to a restaurant, it's probably going to be in Orange County or locally. Uh, when they need home repairs for the home they buy, they're probably going to hire local plumbers, local electricians. They're going to use local dentists. They're going to use local health care. 
they're going to have dance instructions and martial arts constructions or classes for their children at night. They're going to pay real estate taxes that are going to provide salaries and payments for our teachers, for our police, for our fire protection. So having that money stay in the county is very important, and that's the quality of housing. If that family lives in Pennsylvania, in Milford, and he does a 40-mile uh, commute to work every day, not only is that bad for the environment, it's bad for our community because all that money I just talked about is now being spent in Pennsylvania. Um, orders online are paying sales tax in Pennsylvania, and we're not getting the full advantage of the jobs we're working so hard to create in this area. The second fallacy is that low housing, um, low density housing is more protective of the environment. It's exactly the opposite. Denser, more diverse housing opportunities developed in areas that can sustain them around our villages where there's central water and sewer that can be provided are much more sustainable. They provide walkable communities. They provide more diverse housing opportunities for the entire economic strata of our area, which uh, promotes diversity, as an Audi uh, will be able to tell you, for race, gender, accessibility. And by economies of scale, those developers can incorporate green design features that will actually be more protective of the environment. And it will also house the people we need to house, the people who really are the heart of our community. Um, I was driving by community, I'm here, and I'm not going to mention the community, but there was a housing development that had been over 20 years in the making. Um, it's finally being developed, and I looked at it, and it's directly across the street from the high school and middle school in an area um, with access adjacent to a new Dollar General in the, facility of, in the vicinity of three separate villages. The sign on the placard when you drive in the drive says, housing starting at $799,000. Now, God bless the developer. If it's the original developer, I knew him, and he's a great guy. But that's not the housing we need across from our high school and middle school. None of the teachers in our school are going to be living there. None of the, uh, well, you know, unless one of the spouses is a doctor, none of our, uh, um, the workers and the staff there are going to be living there. None of our police officers are going to be able to live there. None of our volunteer firemen are luck likely going to be able to live there. None of the technicians, the nurses, the uh, staff at our local hospitals are going to be able to live there. So we have to identify, and someone making whatever the average salary is going to be at a chip factory that we're working so hard to attract are not going to be able to that, live in that development. So we have to understand, we have to educate not only our politicians, but our community. A lot of times we put a lot of stress on our politicians in our local town or village boards to do the right thing. But there's nobody there at the meetings telling them to do the right thing. We're here at these, these types of conferences and symposiums. We need to bring those employers who are on the second panel to planning board meetings and town and village board meetings to let those people know, we, you want us to stay here, this is what we need. Yeah. You need to help produce it, and you need to educate to the community that there are people out there to support people doing the right thing instead of just coming and complaining when something is done that they don't like. Yeah, so, so we often talk about housing as helping to provide workforce for all of you, but housing also provides a more steady customer base as well, and it prevents customer base shrinkage. I want to add one thing. John mentioned two things that are sort of frustrating or myths about housing. I'll add another one. Uh, the thing where people come out and say, we can't afford this housing because we can't afford to have more kids in the schools. That is the biggest myth going in the Hudson Valley, okay? In the Hudson Valley right now, we have 48,000 fewer kids in our public schools than we did at the peak of enrollment in 2003. We have five counties where every single school district has shrunk by more than 10%. In Orange County, every single school district has shrunk except one. So we should be on our knees praying for a hailstorm of children until they fall from the sky, because that's going to be our future workforce and our future, future customer base. So when you hear people say that, politely tell them they're wrong, and if they don't listen, maybe tell them unpolitely. 
Um, we can't allow that myth to keep going around the Hudson Valley. One quick, one other question, quick, John, a follow up. Uh, briefly, are there any impediments to housing at the local level that business folks should know about, local leaders should know about, that you think they should focus on um, most intently to try to alleviate this housing shortage that we're feeling in Orange County and in the region? Well, really, it goes to the zoning. I mean, the majority of zoning codes in our region, especially in our towns and our villages surrounding the cities that have the infrastructure, just don't allow the appropriate density. It goes to my second point. We have to embrace the fact that we should be building more smaller units, small lot, single family, townhouses, apartments to allow the people we need to live in our community and do it in an environmentally sound manner where, you know, by improving and investing in our water, in our sewer infrastructure, in our local roads, that will allow us to preserve the beautiful farms, the beautiful vistas that we all love about the Hudson Valleys. And I would say the coalition of the willing and the coalition of the people who understand this is growing. They know that, you know, housing doesn't just look like two things, John, right? A single family home on a large lot or an apartment building. There's a whole spectrum of housing in between that, that our sort of outdated zoning doesn't really contemplate or allow. And, and we need to make sure that we have a variety of typologies of housing for the variety of people that we want in our communities and that you all need to employ in your workplaces. Is that we, fair to say? Yeah, we used to call it neighborhoods, and it was much more ac accepted. Uh, you know, the term neighborhood has, um, you know, devolved over recent years, but I know from my generation, which once again, reading my bio is <laughs> like, I, I feel really old, but that's where you grew up. You had a diversity of, you know, economic in, in your area, but you had a stake in your community because that was your home. That's where you went, you know, to study at night. Yeah. That's where your parents had your meals prepared. That's where you dreamt at night. We need to be providing those opportunities. You know, I was the son of an immigrant um, auto body repairman. I was able to grow up with four children and a grandmother living with us in a house that was our house. People similarly situated today in this region would not have those opportunities that I had in, in my community. And we need to look back and say, we need to honor that. We need to provide those same opportunities for those people coming and working hard. I, Thanks, I feel John. like I've dominated. So I'll let's, Thanks. Uh, let's, All right, Donnie, you ready to talk about childcare? All right, I'm gonna share two statistics with you that should be shocking to everyone in this room. Number one, last year when the Department of, uh, Department of Labor, Commissioner Reardon's department, and ESD surveyed employers all across our region. They asked them what was the number one wraparound service that they were most concerned when it came to attracting and retaining their employees. And the number one response in our region was childcare. Now, why is that interesting? It's the first time ever that childcare ranked higher than transportation, okay, ever. Now, why is that? Pattern put out a big regional study on childcare earlier this year. And what we found is that 40% of our childcare businesses in the region have closed in the past 15 years. So we're down 40% of our childcare from just 15 years ago. That includes 61% of the childcare in Newburgh and 50% of the childcare in Middletown. Uh, people are not only having a harder time finding a place uh, where their kids can get early education so they can get to work, they're having a harder time affording it as well. So Donna, can you explain why childcare is an important wraparound service that supports local workers, supports local businesses, and why employers and policymakers should care deeply about sort of the steady shrinkage we're seeing in childcare throughout the region? Um, yeah, first of all, businesses need employees, employees need childcare. And that's where, as Adam said, the shrinkage is faster than, even though there's less children, yep. it's the shrinkage in childcare is much faster than the employees needs. So what's happening is, you know, in my particular case and other providers that I speak to, we have waiting lists that go beyond a year. And the issue we're having is people can't go back to work. And if they can't go back to work, you can't get employees, let alone retain them. Um, there's people, the affordability of it as well. Um, employers are finding that 
people are actually leaving the workforce because of the cost of childcare. And so all that is inevitably going to affect the economy here, not just here in New York State, and it's actually a nationwide problem, which Adam, I'm sure, can attest to. And I think what, what's happening is the employers now, so if a child, if they can't go to daycare today, now your employee's calling out sick, that's costing the employer. The, there's no rescue plan for this, and it's just getting worse. And another daycare closed this past week. And it's for all different reasons, obviously, across the board. But we've seen, in my 20 years of doing this, I have never seen a waiting list as long as I have. And people can, can't accept jobs because they have to have the child care set in place before accepting the job. Yeah, there, and we could, you know, we don't have enough time to go into it today, unfortunately, but there's a whole mix of policy and socioeconomic factors that have really um, hurt the business model for childcare and caused their business model to collapse on itself. Uh, to Donna's point, the region has lost about 12% of its kids in the period of time that we've lost 40% of our childcare. So it shows you we're losing the childcare faster than we're losing our youth population. Donna, so you know, since childcare was ranked as the number one priority for employers in terms of wraparound services for their employees, what do you think the people in this room can do to help get this sort of on the front burner as an issue that more policymakers, more lawmakers, more people who talk about economic development should really care about? Well, I think ed educating themselves more about, you know, partnering with, say, centers or, or whomever, you know, your employees want to go to. And in doing so, there's, we have this image of, okay, it's just daycare. And what's happening, we need, we as providers, need the support of the advocacy of all the employers to get to Albany. Um, it's huge. I mean, Kathy Hochul's got a great plan, but when is it going to happen? And what's happening is we have these inequities in New York State. Um, if you go north of the George Washington Bridge, it's one of my famous speeches, so to speak, where in, so north of the George Washington Bridge and throughout the country, ratios is a big thing. We have a one to five ratio for toddlers. Everywhere other than the rest of New York State, New York City has a one to six ratio. 40 other states also have a one to six ratio. We have a one to five ratio. So in order to open up these spots, we have such inequities within the state, but yet we're one state. And you've, you've heard yeah. me preach this for a while. The same with four-year-olds. We have a one-to-eight ratio. Every state in the nation other than the north of the George Washington Bridge, because New York City is part of that too, is a one-to-ten or higher ratio. That alone would open up numerous spots for everybody throughout the region. And I think that's one of the things we need ad people to advocate for. The bill is sitting in Albany right now um, for toddlers. And if we had that, we can open up more spots and help people. But as far as the employers, you know, maybe come up with a plan. If, you know, you need to retain your employees, you have school holidays. You know, yeah. you know offer as a benefit to your employees, and you're going to retain them. Because when they start taking off all these holidays that the schools have off that most of us don't, would benefit everybody. Yeah, and, I, and I'll, add, I'll add on Donna here. So... This is very important for you all. The statistics I shared at the top indicate that our regional workforce is getting ready to shrink by about 125,000 people in the next 10 to 15 years. As the workforce shrinks, we need very, very high labor participation among the people who remain in order for us to maintain access to the goods and services that we need. One of the things that potentially stands in the way of us having very high labor participation is the inability, especially of women 25 to 44, being able to get to work because there's not enough child care to serve their needs. So this is a really important issue, and I, I don't mean any offense to Donna and her, her colleagues, but when the child care folks go alone to Albany, oh, here come the child care folks again. Same, right? But if they come with the business community, it rings different. So you all have to get involved with this because, you know, your ability to have a workforce is kind of at stake. And, and if those folks don't have a place to not only have their kids washed, but have their kids get that important early education. I want to move on to uh, Inaudi. Inaudi, um, 
Listen, we know that the Hudson Valley is fortunate to have diverse people, diverse places, diverse professions, but we don't often reflect on sort of how we benefit from that. So can you talk to us a little bit about uh, and our understanding of how employers can benefit from tapping into the great diversity that we have here in our region? I mean, the first thing is uh, it's the right thing to do. Having diversity should be something that um, comes naturally. It shouldn't be something that requires an entire uh, procedure, an entire policy. However, it does. Uh, where's Connor? Connor asked for the secret sauce earlier, and Connor, I will give you a big part of that secret sauce from McKesson, and that's diversity and inclusion. Fortune 500 companies, large companies like McKesson have noticed and have realized that have found that diversity and inclusion is profitable. Having folks at the table of different backgrounds, whether it's race, gender, whether it's folks from the LGBT community, folks from different religions, folks with different abilities, you have innovation. You have better problem-solving skills. When you have diversity, the next step to that is inclusion and in what you do with it, right? Because diversity is what you have. Inclusion is what you do with it. So that's how it's profitable. That's how it benefits us, makes us money. But it's also the right thing to do, to be equitable in our communities. Yeah, uh, it's true. I mean, I've, I've said this in my own workplaces over time. People who come from the same place with the same background and the same education tend to have the same ideas. Right. Uh, the more diverse ideas you have, the better you are at innovating, the better you are at your overall uh, work that you do. So that's 100% true. Uh, business and community leaders, though, I, and we even feel this a pattern in some of the research work we do, we're sometimes really challenged to reach out to diverse audiences in a way that's real, right? Um, sometimes those audiences are, are difficult to get at for, for various reasons. So um, that includes when we're recruiting for jobs in Audi, right? So mm -hmm. are there strategies, are there programs, are there departments? If folks want to reach out to a more diverse work pool, what would you tell them to do? Absolutely. So the first thing is you want to uh, define the diversity you're looking for. Diversity is not just one thing. So you have to assess your organization and your business and figure out what am I missing? What do I need more of? Which community is under or not represented at all within my business and organization? And then once you have that, you go where the people are. It's Hispanic Heritage Month. Do you know how many awareness events are out there right now? I can think of three in Newburgh. So if you know that one of the things that you don't have is enough Hispanic representation or bilingual representation in your organization, go set up a table at one of those events. Reach out to them and say, hey, I hear you're having this at the library. I hear you're having this event here, there, et cetera. There's a lot of different events that happen throughout the year where you can literally have a presence. Show up. You don't have time for a table? No problem. Get some staff, some of your outreach staff, and start walking the rounds, attend those events, and say, hey, here's my business card. We are recruiting. The next thing that another strategy that you can use is leverage the team and staff you already have. Create referral programs where you offer, I don't know, 100, 500 $1,000 for any staff member that lasts 30 to 60 days. You figure out what the number is there that's referred from your own staff. If you have happy employees, they're going to be very happy to share your job openings on their social media. And that's another way of diversifying. Leverage the teams that you already have. Another really great thing to do um, is just go out there and find online. Don't stay stuck to Indeed. HVCU Connect. Job boards, job boards, I have it written down here, diversityjobboard.com, diversity.com. Those are all different websites that actually offer diverse employees and diverse employers different options. So get creative. It's all about getting creative. Yeah, we've had some success recently using credible messengers from different segments of the community to help get our pattern work out there. And then the other thing we've done is we've actually just gone to some high school football games, especially the big rivalry games. Yes. You'd be surprised at how much diversity there is from your community at the local big high school sports game. I mean, it's a, it's a good place to go even for recruitment. Okay, it is now 104. I'm going to attempt to put a bow on this because we are now four minutes over time, and I think Steve likes to run on time. Um, <laughs> You know, listen, there are a lot of challenges ahead for the region, just as much as there are a lot of opportunities ahead for the region. I said this when we had our county executives forum in the spring. 
it sticks in my mind a podcast I listened to with some economists who said, it is human nature that we often avoid bad news about our finances and our health, but it's bad to do either, okay? There's great news out there about our regional finances or health, but there is also some troubling news as it relates to demographics, housing prices, workforce populations, and we can't ignore that stuff just to cut ribbons and pat ourselves on the back. We got to see that stuff coming and have a good civic discussion about how we attack those weaknesses to bolster the strengths we already have. We have to be able to go and say to our neighbors that we won't have the goods and services that we like and need unless we have the people who provide them, and we won't have the people who provide them unless we have the housing for those people. We won't have that workforce unless we have robust, adequate, affordable childcare in all of our communities that folks can access. And we won't have it unless we have a diverse workforce that represents the diverse people, populations, and needs that you all have as well. So let's not just look at the things that are going right. Let's make sure we're looking at the things where we have weaknesses and we need to strengthen them to remain competitive as a Hudson Valley and as Orange County. That's my wish for all of you. We're here to be a partner in that. They're here to be a partner in it. Don't be bashful. Reach out to us and have an awesome weekend. All right. Adios.